Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson, where we interview the world's highest quality communicators, professionals, business owners, creatives, and everything in between. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're a high quality communicator, there's a good chance you're living a lot happier life, but you're also bringing those opportunities into your life almost like a magnet. My guarantee is that on this show, we only interview people that I, one, look up to, and two, that I know are going to continue to kill the game for years to come, and I want to make sure they're on your radar. But what I've learned is by asking the best questions, questions, we get the best responses, and that's what the highest quality communicators, our social sellers, are all about. Let's hop inside to the Social Seller Podcast. Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson. Today we have William Morton, not only someone special, a friend, someone that I was intimidated when I first met, because, oh, dude, I can tell on, you saw the world in a great. different lens. Oh, well, that, I love it. I love it. Someone that actually stands quite a bit taller than me, and that does not come that often. Now, you and anyone listening are in for such a cool story and get ready to learn. I would say this interview alone and just going into the pre-work, going into this conversation, yeah. knowing how much thought you've put in and, and really how you can provide value, I'm excited. Now, Me too, if you don't know William Morton yet, William was born and raised in... Right here. San right Diego, here. Ranch in San Diego. Yep. I love it. You're 24 years old. You're a hedge fund manager, founder and CEO of Camshaft Capital Fund something you started right and we're gonna yeah. dive in you're based anywhere from you know la san diego miami new york and you can also find you in in europe now Absolutely. you have innovated investment strategies and different ways to sell and and honestly just accumulate wealth not only for you but for the people around you and your loved ones in ways that haven't been done before there are a lot of firsts for you so i'm excited sure. to dive in now just to add into the mix, you played pro basketball, and that probably adds yeah. part of your European love. Yeah. Uh, and your first trade was at seven years old. So not only do I know... and Not I have something a, you hear common. You don't. No, you really you don't. don't. You don't. And then what I know with you is that your social skills and how hard you've worked at it to yeah. be, you know, to grow up with an IQ being heavy, usually and almost always you lack social intelligence oh, or yeah. that emotional intelligence. Right. So I'm excited to dive in. William, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for coming up, man. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just to dive in, what to give some context, you, you were born in San Diego yeah, born and in we're San here Diego, at one year. And then uh, moved to Montana when I was eight. Okay. So predominantly most of my childhood was in Montana. Eight to sixteen and then moved back down here after. So so I was born here and grew up here, but really I was raised in Montana and a lot of the characteristics of myself is from there especially um the work ethic humility approach to life and the grit which i think is something that's really key to myself especially what you mentioned with um you know the social things and everything to learn and overcome amen i i couldn't agree more what i'm learning is that growing up on a ranch is very similar to what i did in the midwest which is yeah. just we called it a farm right a lot of the same standards beliefs in in cultural things that you have to belong you have to work and i know manual labor was a part of both of our upbringings oh yeah something that you're did, did you enjoy it uh at the time no and what was did some of the stuff that you're doing just to give context because so, I, I don't even yeah. know on a ranch yeah so every day we had to walk our dogs to the bottom of the, of the hill to the gate to about three quarters of a mile and walk them back um we had to leave for school at like 7.05. So we had to like get up like around five. And this was, I started this like fifth grade when we, when we got these two dogs. After that, we had to feed the horses. Now I thought, hey, how about I don't get a horse? So I don't have to feed it. Now my father still wanted me to feed the horse, so I, I fed him anyways, it wasn't even mine. Uh, he's actually pretty smart and it was really tough trying to get things past him growing up because we had to sign in at the gate every time we went there uh, to make sure we actually walked there. Uh, so that was before school. Weekends, we could just do it anytime, but it was every day before school. And we had these huge two dogs, like giant Alaska Malamutes, 150 pounds. I was, I was small then, believe it or not. I was just like, you know, five, six. So these things are, you know, massive, you know, pull on you. Uh, after school, uh, it was predominantly schoolwork. And then on the weekend, just worked on the ranch, irrigation, building ditches, f uh, fences, moving cattle, pulling weeds, picking up rocks. P I picked up all the rocks in our main uh, field, about 180 acres. It took, took me a couple years uh, for that one. Uh, and then uh, during summer, uh, aside from that, we had to read three and a half hours every day before work started. So how about that? What about you? What'd you wow. have to do? Well, well, first off, the walk thing. Yeah. 
you just grew up with caregivers that wanted you to get your morning morning cardio in, right? <laughs> I, I love yeah, it. Yeah, no, I mean, I love my father, uh, but he had this mentality. I think it's a great mentality of work ethic and manual work, but just didn't explain it well. I didn't really you know, say why I was doing things. We were just kind of told what to do. So at the time, it was frustrating because I didn't understand why I was doing something. And here I am doing something that's pretty unpleasant, especially in the winter. So that's actually, I've carried that with me to where I am now, especially uh, in business. Like I always go that extra mile of communicating people, hey, this is why I need you to do this and everything, especially with friends or relationships. I think it's huge. So that was something that really turned something kind of more negative into a positive for myself. Yeah, and, and I agree. It, it builds the grit. And I think we can all build grit, but it's the easiest if we're almost forced to do it looking back, right? It's like yeah. you, you don't enjoy it in the moment, but the older you get, the more you appreciate it and, and you learn the values it, it teaches you. And it applies if you start to learn how to use your brain over your back. And that's what my dad always preached and yep. watching him, you know, he's, he's a farmer and he works his ass off and he's like his build. He looks like a farmer. You wouldn't really want right. to mess with. Right. Yeah. And, and that was how the majority of the upbringing, you know, worked. But it was, you know, the, the difference was for us on a farm, you know, it could be like bailing hay, detasseling in the summer. I did that for a year to, yep. um, you know, just doing chores and things. And it, it, at the time, you compare it to what your friends are doing and they don't have to do it. So you're like, oh, yeah. damn, life sucks. Oh, but the yeah. reality is you're starting to learn these foundational truths. I think that's why it's a lot easier for me to wake up early and um, well, all of those things. to do things you don't want to do. I think that's what you have to do. And really, point. like, in a physical way, which carries over to everything, which is huge. So you have a lot of people now who grew up kind of coddled, you know, told it's okay, you know, not to do well. It's okay to be average. You know, this culture's a little more soft. So they lose a bit of that. So when they're told that, you know, they have to do things, they can't handle it. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I love that you simplified. And I think that's what the best communicators do. I used to think it was how complicated you could, not complicated, but it was using fancy words to show an education and IQ. And it's really not right. The yeah. reality of a quality communicator is how well our message is being received. And I think you right, do such a good job. It doesn't matter what you're saying, how does other person feel or, or you know, receiving it. Yeah. Yeah. Or are they getting my message? Because it doesn't matter how I'm saying it, right? And I think that's a good takeaway we'll talk about in a little bit in Absolutely. team management and, and the people we oh, surround yeah. ourselves with. Now, just to hop in, man, I know for you, February 24th of 2021 is probably a date you'll 2020. never forget. 2020. I apologize. So February 24th, yeah. 2020. What happened on that day? or, or Why well, was that a day you'll never forget? That was the day I began uh, shorting the, the broad market here in the U.S., um, in various different fashions uh, before the COVID crash. After staying up all night, concluding that one was coming. And it was monumental because it literally advanced my career four to six years in various ways, not just monetarily, but confidence. You know, I'd always been a great trader. Um, had a lot of great calls, you know, um, Back in um, Great Recession, silver going to forty-seven dollars. Nailed that. Was a little was was a uh, little kid. Um, Brexit. Um, what happened after that? I think that was pretty simple. I think everyone knew that um, with Britain leaving the EU, you know, markets were going to go into turmoil. Um, throughout the uh, twenty eighteen uh, winter, when the market crashed twenty percent, I thought it was going to recover for a lot of different reasons. I didn't feel that the rate hike was sincere from the feds. They thought they were going to raise the base interest rates that carry over to every aspect of our lives. So the fed will raise the interest rates and then the central bank will raise them. And then the bank that you and I bank from will raise as well. And that affects everything we do because it's built into the price of everything. It costs more to borrow, costs more to produce it stems from every area that puts pressure on the market because all of a sudden now the bottom line is less because the rates are higher. Um, the market just couldn't handle it and crashed, and I bought in a lot. Um, Trump's um, China trade war things were insane. I mean, a lot of people just don't look and do due diligence. Like, the movie Big Short is a great one. You have a guy who's like, that guy's such a genius. Like, how did he think about that? Well, the guy just looked and actually looked into all the different mortgage bonds and saw that they're, they're junk. He just looked. And a lot of people don't look because the information is really dense. And I'm a looker. Like, I look at all the information, every contract I sign. I really look. So when it came to COVID, I just looked. It was crazy because you mentioned I played you know, basketball professionally. I just um, come back and I had hip surgery. I was like, you know, kind of out of it because I was you know, on heavy medication, in rehab, in pain. 
and I've been hearing about this COVID thing. I was like, ah, COVID, COVID, like, you know, we've had tons of viruses, you know, and they don't really do anything. H1N1, SARS, Ebola, it's, it's all, you know, it's whatever, right? Uh, but my father actually had kept, um, you know, Miami is like, you know, you should really look into it. So I finally did. And it was the night of the 23rd, I actually started to dive into it. And all I did is I read medical studies. And I'm not a doctor, you're not a doctor, but it's not too difficult to read a study and to understand that the difference between, you know, multitude of viruses and COVID was extremely significant, especially in the areas of potency, range of, of symptoms, uh, range of mortality, uh, incubation periods, that will lead to a mass spread. You couple that with China shutting down a quarter of a billion people, oil and banks falling off uh, a cliff in January, and for people that don't know, oil, banks, and the industrial sector are the drivers of an economy, and that's because everything you do, you need energy, you need money, and you need uh, products, which are made in those three sectors. So that, to me, signaled that a collapse was coming. So I went in Excel, and I ranked several different um, variables of each virus. I touched on some earlier, um, and I saw COVID being so different. And the biggest thing with the market, and people always get tripped up in this, they'll be like, the market is just, it's too high. It's going to crash. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, when I, when I buy in, like, it was great. Now it's turned around. Like, I don't understand. Like, how can this be happening? Is that the market is always right. And when you're buying a stock, if you're buying Apple, you're not buying Apple. You're buying what people think Apple is worth. That's a huge mm. connect that a lot of people don't really understand. You're right. And you want to say it again? Yeah. So when you're buying a stock, you're not like Apple. You're not buying Apple. You're buying what people think Apple is worth, which is reflected in the share price. So when the share price is moving, it's what people think it should be worth. Not what actually it is or what yeah. it should be. It's what people think. And that's what we trade. So what is that called? Timing. And timing is everything. And... I felt that the minute the market opened up significantly lower than the previous day, which is called a gap down, the crash would start. And the reason is, is that the market and crashes and drawdown is like a car on a road. And on both sides, there are cliffs. And what happens is the road will narrow and widen which will allow the car to move in the road without falling off. So it can handle things. Wider road can handle more, you know, turbulence, right? When the road narrows due to the tighter um, monetary uh, policy, um, worldwide tensions, um, over leveraged debt, some examples, yep. um, even like inflation, for example, uh, the road will tighten. So before COVID, the road had tightened. So... When this, when this happened, I was like, this is the thing that's going to knock it over on the cliff. And that was precursed in January by oil and banks falling off. And when you look at the market, you can always kind of see why things are happening. Mm -hmm. And so that was like more beyond just like, okay, I think, you know, COVID is going to be a lot different than other viruses because X, Y, and Z. Uh, this is actually, this is what's happening in the world. So this, like these things are tying in. So that's what, that's what leads into me making a decision. And then the third step was the timing, which is the hardest part. I mean, it's the hardest thing. You can have great timing, you can have poor timing, and you can be the same person. You know, dumb people can still make money because they got good timing, and very smart people can lose a lot of money because they got poor timing. So when that happened, you know, the morning of the 24th, that's when um, I put on the positions. And it was crazy because I stayed up the whole night. And I was actually on, on a date with the girl who became my girlfriend. Third date, lovely girl. And um, we got back. And I was like, hey, like, I just want to look into this. And she was going to sleep over. And I just told her after the it's like, hey, I just have to really focus on this. Like, I'm sorry. Like, we didn't even know each other that well. But I think this is, like, a life-changing thing. I'm not totally sure. But I need to figure it out. And I don't drink any caffeine or anything. I just stayed up the whole night and just leveled into it. And for me, that's, like, the core of who I am. Like, I will put, you know, other things to the side, including, you know, things like that. 
to focus on what needs to be done. Yeah. And it was a tough decision because I was managing other people's money at the time. And it was, it's a monumental thing because I had not ever shorted the market. I always made fun of people who shorted the market because you're betting on an occurrence that happens one out of 20 times. You look at all the crashes, it never really happens. It doesn't make any sense to do it. Why are you trying to win 5% of the time when you can win 95% of the time, right? But I felt this was different. I had strong conviction and it was one of those things where I was like, you reach the crossroads in your life and this opportunities like this happen maybe maybe once if you're lucky and you either go one way or the other and it happened to me and I took that one path. So I'm thankful that I had the confidence and ability. I think a lot of that came from upbringing, the people I put myself around to do that. And it was, it was wild. I, um, I was the only person in an institution to trade several major expirations on um, the future uh, derivative markets for like the broad index, um, which is a huge marketplace. Like the S&P 500 yeah. contracts at the quarterlies, I was the only one trading them. My broker thought I had been hacked. He's like, why are you buying 1,500 puts? For example, the S&P was, um, you know, well over uh, 3,000 at that point. And I had, I was buying 1,500 uh, puts. Not that I think the S&P was going to go to 1,500. No, maybe. But I knew that those contracts were going to appreciate very high, highly because of multitude of factors we don't have to get into. Uh, and there was no one there. And that that's a huge one. Like those, those 500s, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 are huge. And there was no way to trade in the 2,000s, no way to trade in the 2,500s. Um, and I split up the, the assets into that trade. Longing bonds, because people rush into bonds to put in their money, because when things get tough, they turn to security. And a bond, for those that don't understand, is just a contract with a company or government, for example, like the U.S. Treasury, where you put away your money for an X amount of years, and you get a set percentage interest rate per year, backed by the issuer, which is the U.S. government, pretty secure, right? So people will rush into those. What happens when people move more into those? the return on your investment for new people go down because all of a sudden everyone wants one so now they can lower the price right so the bonds will go up the yield the return will go down yep. moved heavily into those nobody was i, I, I was up like 10 percent away from where the price was uh, which is a huge move for bonds these things don't really move that much um short oil airlines cruise lines and collectively exit my long positions all on the same day and it was, I also bought a lot of calls on the VIX. And that was actually, What's that? the VIX is the volatility index. Good question. Okay, okay. The volatility index measures the expected range of um, move in the S&P 500. And it's derived from different option contracts on the S&P 500. That's, that's where the price comes from. Most people re refer to it as the fear index. So when things go into turmoil, the VIX shoots up. It's really the cost of hedging your position. Really, like, what's it going to cost you to protect your investments? That's what that's what it is. And I bought a lot of those um, several like expirations out, and that was actually my favorite trade of this because the VIX moves very fast and quick. Like, I got in uh, at a very low price. I got out at 82, and it topped that day at 84. Wow. And it closed uh, significantly lower. I think it closed like 65 or something that day. Like, I mean, it went from like 50 to like 84 to like 65. And the next day it was like, I think it was like 50, don't quote me. It's somewhere around there. But it moved so quick. And I exited like on uh, the top of that. That was, on. that was my favorite. I had perfect timing. Like yeah. Everything was lined up for this. Um, and it really gave me, first of all, the capital to start a fund which is not cheap uh, and not the front cost, but it's also the current costs. And it was also the confidence where like, you know, if nobody gave me their money, I was okay. Cause I got enough of my own. And I like, after this, like I can do anything. I mean, that what happened there was a complete anomaly in the market and that we'd never seen anything like that. No, no previous crashes, especially the rate of the speed. Um, so that was, um, that started February 24th. You know? Damn. Damn. Yeah.
unreal. Yeah. Just to to get the breakdown, it makes so much more sense to me how all of that happened, and I didn't realize the fund wouldn't have started without this. Yeah. No. It wasn't a fund. It wasn't a hedge fund before. It was an investment company, investment fund, which is separate than a hedge I gotcha. fund, which is different. It rotate into there. Um, but it was uh, it was interesting because people thought it was crazy. Like I told people, you know, get out. I told people like to sell everything. Uh, you know, I packed up my stuff. I went to Montana like three days after. Like I was like, I'm open space. Everyone thought I was nuts. They thought, you know, mom thought I had a bad reaction to like the, you know, painkillers from the <laughs> surgery. And, uh, you know, I was hoping it wasn't going to happen because I knew how it would affect people. I knew what happened. And it was, it's sad that the majority of why, you know, I am where I am so quickly came off the backs of people dying and, you know, travesty to a lot of people but i don't really look like that i look at it as like it's a situation where you're competing with someone and betting that what do you think they think is going to yeah. happen and that's all it is like i said like i'm not betting that covid is going to go out and kill people i'm betting that people are going to react poorly to that happening and that's the market but it was hard for a little bit because obviously like i'd have much rather have made a lot of money and had my big uh, growth in a more positive environment than other, you know, the travesty, but that's just not how the cards fell. Right. And then there's yeah. the cliche. I mean, the, the most millionaires and billionaires are created in down economies. I mean, it's, it's people that identify opportunity and that's Absolutely. so much what we're treading around. I feel yeah. like in this conversation is no. the fact that, uh, it's, it's the lens on life, right? You can Absolutely. go through adversity. That adversity allows you to have contrast in opportunities, but you start to identify them. And yeah. when you work on yourself, all of a sudden, you, yeah. in, in surrounding yourself around people, right? What I love is I caught the word. You didn't say I was around them. You said you surrounded them. Yeah. That tells me you were purposefully putting yourself in an environments, that, yeah. right? So I'm telling you, like, it's I'm, I'm learning so much as we, we discuss this. And, and uh, it's exciting because it's my same beliefs. And I think that the way you speak about the market and, you know, this is a realm I don't know well yet. Well, and I hope I can break it down simply for you. I, I love it. No, because this is... It's, it's a lot more simple than people make it out to believe. People love to over overcomplicate things, to yeah. make it sound hard, so they seem more superior or whatever, and make it more complicated. It's really simple. I love hearing that. And it's reassuring, right? Because I think for myself personally, I have been one that probably leaned more so, because I don't know, the the... the investment trading realm of what you're talking about as well i naturally lean towards you know it's out of my control there's no way you can read the future like you're putting money yeah. into it yeah the people at the top run it right, right. they run it they have technology they have the ability to do yeah. things normal people can't so yeah. why would i want to play a game it's like going to a casino right i'm not right. a big fan of casinos why Me would either. i want to get into that game right. amen to that right no really <laughs> never been just anything them. lottery anything like it's, it's just, just it's worthy it's, it's just sad the people that are there it's just like they're just life is like it's like you know that harry potter movie uh the third one have you seen it did you ever see harry potter i've seen all books? of them okay so the third one yeah you know the one that goes in and sucks your life away the prisoner of azkaban one you know okay. those little ghost things like they come oh yeah yeah, you, yeah 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 yep. they just eat. that's what i feel be, like being in there like, I, I that's one of the things i'm actually kind of poor at is when I'm around people where I'm seeing like that, I I just feel like I'm just decaying inside. Just leave. So yeah, I can't not to go on a rant, but yeah, no casinos. Yeah. So give me some other examples for you, because obviously I can see in your body language too, and, oh, and yeah. like it does make you feel uncomfortable. Well, so what other environments are like that? Comfortable. It it's just that like I could be doing better for myself. Yeah, and but I, it's creating an emotion in you, and that's oh, yeah, why I'm saying comfortable. Oh yeah, yeah. I can it, see it, your body it's just, too. It's irritating. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not like in a bad way, but it's just like. I don't understand, and it's fine. I don't need to understand yeah. what, pe you know, you're doing in your life, and that's totally you're doing your own thing. But for me, like, I don't want to be around that because, like, that doesn't coincide with where I'm going. Yeah. And I'm a little more, I'm a lot more intense in that aspect. Of, like, yeah. you know, I can be harsh with people, but also very kind and thoughtful. And I don't have a tolerance for th those type of, you know, behaviors or characters where you're just the choices you're making in your life are in your own control and you're choosing not to better yourself. Like, I don't care where you are in your life as a person. What I care about is where you're going. And that is the same thing in stocks. And there's a lot of similarities between the market or, you know, talking women or yeah. and, and people. It's the same thing. And it's like, you know, I, 
I love seeing overweight people in the gym. It's one of my favorite things. It's like awesome. Love it. I right? used to be like that when I was a kid. Like I was. Yeah. You wouldn't want, want guess now, but I was. And when I see people who just don't do that, I yeah. just I just don't want to be around them. I just don't because it's it just I feel like who you're around affects you so much. It's like at a cellular level, you know. It's just like it's your environment shapes you. You know, so I'm a big believer in that because I think that is a huge part of where I am here. Like you said, surrounding myself with people I have is why, you know, a big part of why I didn't want to go to college. Yeah. Because I just couldn't identify with that crowd. Not that, you know, it's a generalization for everyone, but it's just for me, it's something where I felt that the majority of those people and decisions they make doesn't align with what I want to do. And it's not the best place for me to get to where I want. It's not efficient. Right? Exactly. And I love that you say that because it's, we're all chasing what makes us happy, right? Yeah. And, and for you and getting to know you, I know you, you mean it just because that's the lens you have on life. Now you are in a different caliber, especially at 24 years old, that you have those beliefs and you have those filters set in your mind of this is what I, you know, this is acceptable behavior. This is non-acceptable behavior for myself. And then because you started living congruently yeah. and in doing that, then naturally you want to surround yourself with other people like that. So it starts feeling comfortable when you're around those people. And I think for anyone listening, I'm sure you can, you can feel that same sense when there's certain friends or family members or people in your life that you have to see every once in a while. And when you do, you don't really look forward to it. And you know it's going to mentally and emotionally maybe yeah. be a little taxing. I feel like that's a similar in some way. Yeah, I know. I know you. You're interviewing me, but I want to I ask you a question. Let's hear it. So, for me, when those situations happen, I will do my best, what I can, what I think is appropriate to, to help them. I don't just don't, you know, just because cut people, cut someone off if they're going through a hard time or they're just making poor choices. This, you know, we've all made poor choices, right? That's not fair. Uh, my question is is when that is happening, how successful have you been at actually reverting the behavior or course of someone going through? Because for myself, I said I can communicate pretty well and get across people. I have found that it only damages actually our relationship because then the person shifts, you know, what you're trying to do to, to attack on them. And when I first started, it was hey, I don't think what you're doing is right or this, whatever. And I try to give justifications. And then I just moved to what I thought, which was the best, which is just saying things to allow the person to make up their own mind or decision. Like, you can't tell them what to do, but tell them the things that they need to know so that they can make a decision. Kind of frame it, you know, how you want. Uh, but my question is, I, I find it's generally an unsuccessful endeavor and leads to turmoil in the relationship. And it's just kind of sad. What are your thoughts? Great question, man. I love yeah. it. And anything related to communication and influence, yeah. I love because this is something for me. For for you, you learn numbers before you learn the alphabet, right? Yeah. You were seeing numbers. Numbers made sense to you, where most kids, myself included, Oscar, like we were, we were that, right? So because of it, other things started to take shape, and you started to use it as an advantage. Now, for me, it was communication, and I've gone through all of those in-betweens, right? Yeah, because you come in thinking, hey, I'm like, I'm learning these things. I just want to share it with the world. I want to share it with you because I care about you, right? Now, the challenge is, is what energetic level you're bringing to that individual if they're not at that level or if they haven't put that thought in. Obviously, obviously seems like you're trying to demand or tell you how to live a life. Like yeah. how, you know, in, in certain ways it might have felt when we were kids and didn't have context for having to go out and do chores or, or work, right? right? No kidding. It's like, well, why the hell are you coming in here? Like, you know, you could be at a bar or a social yeah. setting. And, and um, what I've come to find out, and it wasn't until the last year, and it was trial and error and being fortunate to talk to a lot of people right yeah. and in valuing it and having a curiosity like you do for numbers that curiosity for me is in communication now if that was to happen nowadays i'm going to position it more as first off i probably won't even dive into it right i think the context where this conversation mm -hmm. started was like if we're at the casino right and i'm there w first with, off, with your friend like your friend's I'm, going to the casino a lot and maybe it's oh, oh this yeah. is someone this is a yeah, friend yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, someone you okay. know is like they're and they're going there too much and you're you know you know it's bad everyone knows it's bad and you're trying to get them to shift away from yeah it. yeah you know how successful have you been actually been able to do that yeah yeah, yeah. so my, it, it's i mean people make their own choices and they're gonna I think people i think society especially culture gives too much credit 
to uh, it's too hard or you can't and these different things because like i know when i do things that are wrong i have a conscious choice like we have willpower yeah like you want to go do something i'm supposed to like you can choose no yeah and so i find that it's on them that's what about you it always comes down to all of us, right? right? So like the same thing and the the one point I want to make with the, the conversation right before this is that the market speaks, right? Mm. Just having that understanding for me, it does in, in business to business sales, right? And yeah. dealing with the companies that, that people are trading, right? And on your side, it's where your investments are going to go. At the end of the day, it's not how good you think your products or product or service is. It's are people buying it, right? Exactly. And there can be that truth that a lot of people don't want to believe. And I think that applies in life too. So for most people that might not have defined those things, then it's not going to make sense. But I think the quality of a relationship and being a mature male and having a fellow male relationship, that that should be foundational. And I do that often with my guy friends. We have those conversations oh, yeah. that it's, hey, like I, it, there's always that understanding and we, we vocalize it every once in a while to remind each other that, I want you to hold me accountable. Like you see me ever doing you shit, want slipping to be held up. That's please what do. Best relationship is. And I know you're coming from that place. Yeah. For one tactic to help here is in this exact example because maybe it's happened to you. I might go with the friend and meet him, and I'd try to figure out a way that it could be one on one, right? And go there for this night to meet in in a comfortable place on his terms, right? And and obviously, like you know, you know, giving context beforehand, I, sure. I've got an obligation. All right, you know, I've got 90 minutes. I'm excited to see you. Yeah. Sitting down. And when the, uh, when the conversation's right, right? Not hopping in, seeming like there is there is that motive coming in, but just helping them understand how much you value them and making yeah. some of those authentic statements and helping them, helping them understand that, hey, you know, I value your future. Is it okay? This is the big thing. This is asking permissive language. Yeah. Is it okay if I tell you something you might not want to hear, but something that I think you'll always thank me for down the road? Right, so that could be great, one version. One. But now it could also be, is it okay if I give you a piece of advice? Or, yeah, yeah you know, is, I'm asking for permission because oh, okay. now I'm not telling you, yeah. right? And you'll see people like Tony Robbins do this. You'll see David Meltzer do this. You'll see Dave, you know, uh, um, Asaref to like the people that have studied communication to that level. And then it bleeds into the same discipline and living that lifestyle like the way we're talking about. And what I'm excited for you is as you start to uncover more and more of how the spiritual components kind of bring a lot of these things that we're talking about together. Oh, and huge. yeah, yeah, because the energetic I, thing yeah, you're talking I, about I is, so, you is, that, is so yeah, I real. I meditation very heavily uh, for five years. Oh, so tell me more. Like when, when was that? What age and, and what was the context? Why did you get into it? 18. Um, I, I got into it. <laughs> it was, well, we didn't talk about this, but um, part of why I was able to make that trade when I was seven years old um, and actually like. You know, people are like, well, you know, he's just like, you know, buy an apple because he got a hundred dollars. Like, no, no, I, I bought uh, gold because I felt that the um, rate adjustment from the feds was going to bolster the gold market. And that was what I said. So there's like, you know, actual planning going on into that. And I was able to understand that because when I was born, my brain allocated uh, most of the weight to the left brain, which is the analytical side. And not a lot, well, a lot did go to the right, which is the creative, linguistic speaking side, but there just was a huge gap, like a 20 IQ gap, which is massive. So it's like, imagine, you know, if you don't, most people don't understand how brains work and why should you, but it's imagine like, you know, there's a road, right? Of communication and a 20 IQ gap is like this. Like you're talking about, put your hands out about a foot, a foot apart. And then, you know, you're trying to go and like, you know, trying to make turns. You can't make a turn. You fall off a cliff, right? You're done, right? So I wasn't able to speak very well. I actually had a speech impediment uh, and a slur, stutter. Couldn't understand anything socially, uh, especially kids my age. Like I would sit there and I'd have zero clue what was going on. Like, why is this person making fun of me? Why is this person saying, like I had, like I'm talking about zero, like, I mean, zero awareness. Like they diagnosed me with um medium um, level Asperger's actually wow. uh, and it was I'm mean, tying back into the meditation thing but that, that came into uh, helping grow in that area but it was something I had to very actively work on and I think my mother for this one said, seriously because she sat me down when I was a little kid and it was like you know you can either work on this and it's going to be very hard very challenging frustrating t tough I was like, you know, like four years old 
Um, and then, you know, in like 10, 15 years, you're going to thank yourself. Or you can just not spend all these hours doing it and go, you know, live a great little childhood life. Like, you know what? I'm going to do that. And that's been my whole mindset ever since then. So shout out to my mom for that one because that was very, um, you know, huge. In so my I'm guessing life. she was practicing it too, right? Because yeah, she, was, she would help me. Yeah, and, and that's a quality parent, right? Because it's quality leading parent. by example, great, too. Great, if you are great parent. Um, so it wasn't until, like, 13, 14, 15 where I could be able to, like, understand, like, so, like social skills and things well. Like, I'd, I'd be off. I'd be, like, you know, like, that weird, dorky, like, what like, what are you doing? Just no awareness. So um, everything I learned socially came from like active learning so that's why when i look when i gave you the example about the people and the friends and you know falling off the whole casino thing it's like i have learned from like you know studies reading understanding numbers patterns so it's a very different approach to social things and now i'd say that my social skills are one of my strengths which is a huge part of you know why i raise um you know a good amount of money and a lot i've done pretty quickly um so the meditation came into play because it really helps your brain i think it's like so funny how people work out the bodies like you know you and i we work out our bodies and but people don't work out the brains and that's what it is and it allowed me, it, me to become better at every aspect of my life and i went from reacting to responding and that actually carried over to my trading too um so it was something that you know i still practice now and i think is huge is to remain that level-headed you know, no matter what's going on. And there's some things, you know, we all got things to work on. Something for me, you know, is uh, incompetence with someone is something that really pisses me off. Like, yeah. I'm okay with whatever happened in the world. Like, I had, you know, two thefts that were huge, like back-to-back weeks, cross side of the countries, lost everything. It wasn't even there. It was crazy. I got told I didn't even, like, didn't even, should, I, I was like, okay, I didn't even care. But, uh, you know, driving with someone and you miss a turn when you're supposed to because you're not paying attention because you're on your phone, that bothers me because yeah. that's a conscious choice, right? It's yep. not like, you know, something just happened. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's why we get along well is because you are you understand that too. Yeah, yeah, and I love what you say because if I would have been, if we would have had this conversation three years ago, uh-huh. I mean, well, three years younger when we had this, right. you, you made this same topic, not only would I be slightly intimidated when you explain all these things and like, oh, well, you know, you were, you were born with the DNA that like allowed you to do this. And, and I think a lot of people might forget about the adversity that made you who you are. And I think oh, that's, yeah. the, that's the cherry on top that people really need, I, including myself. We all need to understand that the adversity is what builds us here. So I'm glad why you've reached success at this level is because you can also openly talk about them now. The spiritual component. Amen. Right? Absolutely. And the hardest, I don't want to say the hardest part. The most beautiful part for me has been that you don't get an immediate return. It's mm-hmm. that thing like you had said, you know, I, I love the context that you say five years, right? Because I, I do think it's a minimum of a year, two years. And after you've been doing it a few years and five years yeah. or more con- consistently, right? Trying to do it every day because I think consistency is the magic there. All of a sudden you start to realize things in your life start to make more sense, but you're in control of your emotions. I used to have some anger problems and, and challenges, right? Especially in athletics and things, yeah. I think, and, and just not understanding myself. And I, I couldn't imagine for both of us, you know, going through different phases of like trying to fit in. And you had straight up said, you know, right before we hopped in and, and you mentioned it there is like communication is one of your strengths now, but it wasn't before. So it took oh, you consciously God. knowing that yes. and then saying, I can create a planner strategy, right? And yeah. I'm going to, um, when you would go on, you know, uh, what was it like talking to women, you know, in high school or even the beginning of college when you obviously would have been a star at wherever you oh, played? Yeah. Didn't, but didn't go to college. Oh, shit, uh, I forgot. You high school did, dropout. Yeah, but um, it was uh, <laughs> uh, brutal to be putting it lightly. Uh, Do you have one story just to give me an example? 